The opposite of fear is bravery. Hmm. Nope. The opposite of fear is curiosity. Is the glass half empty? Is it half full? That misses the point. Elevating curiosity will help you see and understand what's in the glass. This is Applied Curiosity Lab Radio, the podcast of curiosity. In each episode, Becky Saltzman interviews unconventional thinkers and doers in her unconventional way to dissect and uncover what you can use to see things others miss, make better decisions, and apply your talents in new and profound ways. Elevate curiosity. Escape the boundaries of ordinary. When I type those words, fade in, there is nothing more exciting, terrifying, intimidating. It's all of those things. And if it ever becomes anything other than that, then, then you should be done writing because it's the thrill of the journey at that point. I'm telling a story. Welcome to Episode 2 of Applied Curiosity Lab Radio. I am your host, Becky Saltzman. Today, I am in the studio with Mike Rich. Mike is an American screenwriter best known for his sports-related films of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I met Mike and his wife, Grace, years ago through our mutual friends, Jeannie and John Paul. And I've loved watching Mike's film career take off almost as much as I've loved watching his uplifting films. But until now, I've never really had a chance to sit down with Mike to explore how he made his latish in life transition because he was working as a news director and show host for a top radio station in Portland, Oregon. And he carved out just a few hours each day to write the screenplay Finding Forrester. And with his wife and three kids at home, he went for it. Sony greenlighted the film, and Mike went on to win the prestigious National Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, Nicole Fellowship in Screenwriting, and his film went on to become a box office smash starring Sean Connery. Mike left radio, although, as you'll hear, that Carmelie voice never left him, and he went on to write successful films such as The Rookie, Radio, Miracle, The Nativity Story, Secretariat, and Cars 3, and he's currently preparing for his holiday launch of his first book, Scavenger's Hunt, and I can hardly wait to get my eyeballs on that. And you'll hear a little bit about that and where you can go to pre-order in this episode. In this episode, we cover a lot of ground, mainly about the film industry, past, present, and future. But Mike shares a lot of actionable bits, like how he was able to tackle the logistical challenges of making a midlife career shift, and he hints at how you can do the same. We talked about the difference between writing news stories, and writing screenplays, and how to sow the seed of an idea into a tangible product or story, film, book. We talked about the anatomy of a screenplay, his favorite part of the process of filmmaking, and what works best. This really gives you a peek inside the film industry. And for anyone interested in either making a career shift late in life or latish in life, looking at getting into a creative profession, specifically the film industry, you're not going to want to miss this conversation. And so let's jump on to it. Let me give you an opportunity to enjoy Mike Rich. Hey, Mike, thanks so much for coming to my studio to join me. It's, it's always a pleasure. It's good to see you, Becky. Good to see you. One day you were a very successful local radio DJ and news director. Another day you were a filmmaker. And then a third day today, you're a highly successful filmmaker. What are a couple of the most instructive or important moments that existed between then and now? It's interesting because for me, the path that you just described, it usually doesn't work out that way in the film industry. The film industry is always viewed as something that is a young person's game, that you have to live in Los Angeles. And I was up here in Portland. I was 38 years old when I got started. But the one thing that the style of writing, because you're right, I was a news director. And when you're writing news stories for on the air, the key to that is to get to the point as quickly as possible. They always had those rules, who, what, where, when, why. And the first sentence of your writing has to clearly get to the point of what the story is that you're trying to tell. It's just the opposite. 
when you're writing a screenplay. What you're trying to do is you're constructing this collection of about 60 scenes in most films. That's about it. That's the average 60 scenes. And each of those scenes has to serve a clear purpose. There can be no window dressing. You have a really valuable limited amount of time when you're writing a script and it's just the opposite. What you want to do is instead of being clear and getting the message across really, really quickly to the audience, you want the audience to learn something, ideally more than one thing in each scene, but you don't want them to realize that they just, that they just learned that. You want it to be so subtle that it is something that at the end of the movie or when you're making that transition into act three, they realize they have all this information and they don't they don't feel like it was spoon fed to them. How did you learn that specifically? Not in a general way, but where did you go to learn that? I watched a lot of movies. <laughs> so you dissected that I, on your own. I, yeah, I, I didn't go to film school. But what I did, I joke because, of course, you know, here in the Portland area, we have the greatest independent bookstore in, in the world, in my opinion, Powell's Bookstore. And when I started... I would go down to Powell's and I would, they, they had such a great film section and I would buy these books of, you know, old screenplays. I mean, I remember buying everything from The African Queen with Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn to Reservoir Dogs, Quentin Tarantino. And then I would, I would read those scripts and then I would watch the movie. So it, I was, I, I guess I was, I was pretty much self, self-taught in a lot of ways. Now, Looking back, I took a lot of creative writing courses in school. I had a terrific teacher in high school. So there was always that desire to tell stories. And I was a voracious reader, still am. But I think for most screenwriters that have had a measure of success, it's because they can see the story. So are you able to watch a film or were you able to watch a film? And how does it differ then from now more as an ape? Like I watch a film and I'm an ape. I'm just watching a film part of it. I'm not a Jane Goodall. I'm not dissecting what constitutes a good film. Do you watch films differently than you used to then? Or is it the same process? A little bit. I, I watch them a little bit differently, but I can still go there just like you can. I mean, I can get lost in a film. I don't end up dissecting things. But there are moments where now there'll be just this small thing which will flicker for me where I go, well, that was an interesting choice. Or wait, wait, wait a second. This scene is a little redundant from the one three scenes ago. And so, yes, there are red flags that pop for me that probably don't pop for the average a movie goer. Was Finding Forrester the first screenplay that you wrote? No, it wasn't, but it was close. I wrote three screenplays beforehand and all starting. Finding Forrester hit the screen in the year 2000. I wrote it, finished it actually in 1998, but I wrote three screenplays beforehand, which were really bad. I mean, they were just really, really bad, but I'm really proud of them because if you were to go in my office, I've got the screenplays that I've written up on the shelf. And I've got those three right there because they served a purpose. When did you realize they were bad? I think probably not initially. I was, <laughs> and, and, and I'm glad I didn't send them out as, as widespread as I probably wanted to. But with each script that I wrote after Finding Forrester and got to learn a little bit more, it became obvious to me that they were not they were not quality stories, let's put it that way. So it wasn't a fact that you just had this story finding Forrester in you that you wanted to get out in the world. You actually thought, I'm going to make this transition into being a screenwriter? No, not, not exactly. I mean, I love writing stories. For me, it is, I think everybody has that creative release. For some people, it might be music. For some people, it might be photography. It can be anything, but I think it's important for each individual to have a creative outlet. And so I was writing short stories quite a bit. And I made the transition to trying these screenplays, not so much because I had this vision of a new career. I did it because I like film and I, I wanted to try that style of writing. So what did that transition look like? I mean, specifically... How did you get Finding Forrester out in the world? And also, how did you juggle everything? Can you unpack that time in your life? It was a wild time in my life. So I had written Finding Forrester. And at that point, I knew that it, was, I knew that it wasn't a perfect screenplay. 
but I knew that it was a good idea. And I actually got it during an on-air interview. I was working at Kink FM in Portland. I was doing the morning show, uh, which in itself was a a logistical challenge because I was getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning to be on the air by 5 o'clock. The show was from 5 until 9 a.m. We were interviewing... Joyce Maynard. Joyce Maynard was a syndicated columnist. She was terrifically talented. And back in the day, she had an affair with J.D. Salinger. And I remember she had written this book. And so she's talking about it on the air. And when an idea sparks for a screenplay, it's just a seed. And that's what it was. I was during the interview, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, wait a second, you know, because she had this one line where she said that the novelist of the previous century were like rock stars, uh, whether it was Hemingway, whether it was Fitzgerald, whether it was Salinger. And then she said one line, she said, and most of them put up this wall around them and nobody ever got through that wall. And for me, it was the, just the notion of what if somebody got through the wall? And that's what the story became. It became the story of Jamal Wallace, this 16 year old kid, African-American kid in the Bronx, who befriends this character, William Forrester, who is a fictional novelist who wrote one book, very much just like J.D. Salinger. And for me, I was so excited to write it, but, you know, my wife and I have three kids. They were 14, 12, and 8 at the time, so I had this two-hour window. It was a two-hour window that would start at 1 p.m. and would end at 3 p.m. when the kids got home, because when the kids got home, the creative window kind of slammed shut. But instead of getting overwhelmed at the notion, well, I can't do that. I can't write a script in in just two hours. But most screenplays are 110 pages to 120 pages. One page equals one minute on the screen, by and large. And so all of a sudden I said, wait, wait, wait a second. If I just write Monday through Friday, 1 to 3 p.m., I, I'll even take weekends off. If I can just write two pages a day. Then all of a sudden I go, wait, two pages a day, 10 pages a week, 40 pages, you know, in a month, and I'm done in three months. Then all of a sudden I go, that's doable. And so that's what I did. But I had to make sure that those two hours were a sacred two hours and nothing could ever interfere with them. It's really a math calculation. You just kind of broke it down into simple math and and then it kind of all made sense. Yeah, it's funny because anybody who's written a book or anybody who's written a screenplay, it is a purely creative endeavor. But there are some things, you know, folks who have read a lot of the uh, books about the three-act structure of a screenplay, which by and large, if you take that 120 pages, the first 30 pages are act one, the middle 60 pages are act two, and then the final 30 pages are act three. And the first 30 pages are establishing your characters, who they are, what the obstacle is that they're going to confront, and putting them on a path to solving that. The middle 60 pages are the most difficult. They are incredibly, incredibly difficult because you have to sustain the story. Do you uh, write them in order? I mean, is that how you do I it? Do it. Do, I, I do and, it. And way. when you talk to other screenwriters, is that... Is that a common almost way to all, do it? Yeah, almost all of them approach it that way. Now, there are, are certainly different ways before you start type. You type those two words, fade in, to start your script. There are screenplay writers who have to make sure that they've got everything outlined. Every scene, I talked about those 60 scenes. They know what those 60 scenes are. It was a little different for me, and, it's, and it still is, because I know where I'm going to start. I really know where I'm going to end. And I know benchmarks along the way. But it's almost like I I, I draw the analogy of, let's say you're going to drive to New York from Portland. Okay, so you know where you're going to start. And you know where you're going to end. You have a roadmap. You know you're going to go this way. But I love that notion and the possibility of, well, that looks like an interesting road. I'm going to go down there for a bit. Sometimes it turns out to be nothing, and sometimes it turns out to be something. And and that's why I tell aspiring writers, you know, don't get too married to this notion that 30 pages is your first act. If you go off on one of those roads and you're finding something of interest, you can't go, well, wait a second, I've only got two more pages and then I have to make a transition. Drive down that road. Drive down that road as long as it takes to find out if it's going to be of value to you. What is the process, and has it changed for finding out whether that detour 
is a detour or actually the meat of the story? I think I now have a better sense a little bit quicker as to I'll do a U-turn a little faster if I know that it's not going to go. Are there any tricks that you can share with people? One of my favorite parts of the process is two things, research, because a lot of the scripts that I've written whether it's The Rookie or or Secretariat, those are based on true stories, which has its own challenge and its own benefit. And every time that I've gone out to meet with an individual that I'm basing a story on, I always go in, and I think it's very natural, you always go in with a default assumption of what your story is going to be. And every time I have found out that the story that I want to tell is not the one that I had at the default. I learned something about. So, um, even with a true story, even with the true story. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I remember Jim Morris, who Dennis Quaid played in the rookie, which was a story about a high school baseball coach, uh, who had to give up on his own dreams because he had four surgeries and then, but there was unfinished business there. So that's what I thought the default was going to be. That's the default story. But I get out there and I start talking to him out in West Texas And it takes a couple of days before they, you know, get enough trust in you to really start talking. And I remember clearly as I'm sitting here right now, him saying, well, my father and I had a little bit of a complicated relationship. And then you just go, okay, I'm going to turn down that road. And that's not only at first when he started talking about his father, I'm thinking to myself, okay, this this is going to be a good subplot. This is a good thread. And then the more he talked, I go, well, wait a second. No, this, this is the movie. This is the movie. I, there's, the, there's that timeless theme that so many books and stories have, have pursued of sons trying to gain the acceptance of the father. And this was the opposite. It was the father trying to gain the acceptance of the son. And that was really interesting to me. Do a lot of screenwriters do both the fiction and nonfiction, or is it usually you're specialized in one or the other? For the most part, I think everybody, even if they might not want to admit it, have a wheelhouse. And for me, it was, I was a sports fan, always was a sports fan. So stories and stories like the ones, you know, we've talked about Secretariat and and, and The Rookie, those are appealing to me. But I also like them to be these kind of intimate character stories. But I often say I I love stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. The benefit of sports is that by and large, there's usually a black and white element to that. You either win or you lose. And so that was appealing. But I've branched out and there have been moments where, I mean, I wrote the nativity story, which was exactly that. It was a story of the, you know, the Christmas story with Joseph and Mary. Did you think of that as a Fiction? Did you approach that as a fiction or a nonfiction? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a great question because the only source material you have are about you know a, a short couple of paragraphs in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew, and so it's a little bit of a daunting task to say, okay, I'm going to come up with dialogue for Mary and for Joseph, and you just realize you are playing with a hot pan right there. But it was great. I mean, that was that was part of the excitement. I, I I often say, even though I've been in this business now almost twenty years, wow. that when I type those words fade in, there is nothing more exciting, terrifying, intimidating. It's all of those things. And if it ever becomes anything other than that, then then you should be done writing because it's the thrill of the journey at that point. I'm telling a story. So I was imagining you showing up to talk about the character that Rookie was based on. Yeah. In the very beginning, you're showing up to meet these people to tell their story. Do you have a process for making them trust you, for getting to the root of it? And and has that process changed as you've done more and more of these type of stories? Is, is there... Is, do you have to get in a mindset? Do you have a list of questions? What's your technique for doing that? It's a couple of things. Number one, you have to devote time to it. You have to budget time. And by that, I mean, if, if I'm going to go out to Big Lake, Texas, which is out there in West Texas, you know, I cannot just have a four-hour session one day. I go out there for days. And silence is 
the best weapon you can have in the book because, you know, you just, you just shut up and you just let them talk. But it takes a while. The first day I talk quite a bit to them. I ask questions that I know I, I don't go to the, the heart of the matter. I'm just getting to know them. What's one of your questions that you feel is the biggest return on your investment question? I mean, I have one when I interview people, I call it my MVQ. And it may, it may sound trite, but it's a question that I ask. I used to ask it in my previous career in real estate where if asked this question, I got the biggest ROI. And the question for me was, what did your childhood smell like? Oh, see, that's great. I, I like that. I, I don't know if I have one. That's a good one. Uh, I, I don't have one per se. And it maybe varies from project to project. I remember there was... I wrote the script for a movie called Radio, which had Ed Harris and Cuba Gooding Jr. in it. And at the at the very core of the story, it was about this high school football coach who befriends this developmentally disadvantaged uh, young man. And it was the most unlikely of friendships. And I remembered asking Harold Jones, who was the real life character of the football coach, why'd you do it? And knowing that I wasn't going to get the answer... And his stock answer was, it just seemed like the right thing to do. And that's what I would always get. And it was months, months later. And he knew that I, that I suspected there was something else there. But we had gotten to the point where he had absolute trust in me. And I remember he called me. And he goes, well, there was this one thing. And I remember he told me the story of why he did it, which dealt with his own childhood and another developmentally disadvantaged kid that he did not come to the aid of. And I said, Harold, this is your penance. And you could almost hear him shrug his, his shoulders. And so getting back to that question of tips, be patient, be patient and wait and, uh, and and listen, 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 listen. I worked with Gus Van Zandt, the director of Finding Forrester. I never, ever have worked with anybody who was a better listener. And that's what makes him a great director. How did you, how, how did that look? How does a good listener look to an outside observer? Sometimes people, people are uncomfortable with good listeners because it falls out of the, that rhythm of conversation. Like I said, at first it's, you have to quickly get to a point uh, married couples, a lot of married couples can, they have that comfort of silence. You have to get to that within just a, a period of a few days. So, I mean, the tips, I guess, would be know that you're not going to get your breakthrough on day one. You may not get it on day three. You may not get it for a week. It may take months. But don't pressure yourself to sit down at the keyboard and begin writing. Because I'm a big fan of the walk. I, I, I get out and I walk and I walk and I walk and I think. That's writing. That is as much writing as me sitting down at a keyboard and starting to hit those keys. There's actually some interesting evidence of it. A Stanford study just came out of Stanford, I think this year, that analyzed people's creative process. I'm not sure exactly how they measured creativity, but they found that walking and creative output was at least correlated. So I mean, it was an interesting study because they also put people in a wheelchair and they walked them out. So it wasn't just being outside. It actually turns out that being ambulatory outside versus inside was directly correlated with a higher level of, I don't know if qualitatively, but at least quantitatively a higher level of creative output. So that's, that's interesting. I think, I think, yeah, you'll, you'll talk. I remember Ron Howard, the director, he was a big fan of the drive, which I guess in Los Angeles makes yeah, sense, right. but. But everybody has that where a place that they can go to let thoughts begin to percolate. Are there certain elements or aspects or features that you always flush out when you're creating great characters, whether they're fictional characters or not? Are there, you always have to have this and you always have to have that. I'm not a, I, I, I don't, there are writers out there who will write 60 page biographies of their characters before they ever, and, and I don't go there, but I always make this short list I, I like to answer the questions of, you know, what does my character find humorous? What are the things, the hobbies? It's that kind of a profile. What does my character consider to be his or her greatest strength? What is my character's actual strength or weakness? And and uh, oh, those are good. Ones. And and so you get you get a sense which are 
they, these become backbones because by and large, and character is the most important thing. It's much more important than story. You can have the strongest story in the world, but if you don't create characters that an audience or, or readers are, are invested in, then it's, the story is, is not going to carry the day. Mike Rich is an award-winning filmmaker and author of the book Scavenger's Hunt. A lot of entrepreneurs think of their clients or their avatar before they put something out. I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of a analogous situation with artists. How much do you think of, okay, this movie or this film is going to be seen ideally by this avatar or this market segment? And do you think about that? And how does that work into considering aspects of character? I don't know if I do. To me, the whole character notion is, and you don't have to, you know, you don't have to create a character that the audience falls in love with. You just have to create a character that the audience finds compelling. I mean, Brian Cranston's character in Breaking Bad, you know, it was one of the most complicated, beautiful characters that, that we've ever seen. And it was because they explored all of those things. They explored his strengths. They explored his weaknesses. And there were so many layers to him that... I was addicted. It was like he was my meth. Yeah, right. I, literally, <laughs> figuratively and literally. Yeah, exactly. But I just recall with so many of these characters, and I've written scripts that the ending, everybody, like Secretariat. Secretariat's a perfect example where you know the ending. You know you know how it's going to, I mean, Apollo 13 was for Bill Broyles was the same, same example. Is that harder when you know the ending? It's harder because it, forces you, here's what you have to do, is you have to get the audience to a place where they not only don't care that they know how it's going to end, they just want to experience that moment with these characters. I mean, think about it when Tom Hanks was playing Jim Lovell. And you know, he's, I mean, He's going to be okay. We know he's going to be okay. But at that moment, we have become so invested with him, with his children, with his wife, with his friends. And, and, and so we just want to see their reactions. We want to be a part of the joy in that particular moment. Okay, this may be a dumb question, but as a curiosity maven, right? I ask questions and some of them are dumb. Is there a difference between being a screenwriter and being a filmmaker? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, I mean, is there technically or is there artistically in the unions? Is it different in the in the unions? Yeah, because there's a, there is a clear delineation of skills, if you will. There's a director's guild. There's a writer's guild. There's a producer's guild. But what about filmmaker, screenwriter? Well, it's kind of a, a curious thing because there's a, a bit of a controversy where you'll see directors take a, a film by credit where it'll say, you know, the director of a, a film by Joe Smith. And that can be, as a writer, I'm going, well, wait a second. That film is not by you. The film is by all of us. They, I mean, one of the most rewarding things I can experience is when a, one of my films comes out is to watch the credits afterwards. And I realize, I mean, I see so many names of people who become friends and then and this was the team that we assembled. But I've never had a real desire to direct. You never uh, have. Never, never really have. I just love writing the story. I love telling the story. Does that mean I'm a filmmaker? Probably not. But, I mean, we're all filmmakers. A director cannot make a film by himself or herself. So no one, speci there's not a set of job criteria that makes one a filmmaker it's the filmmakers are all part of the process of making a film. So yeah. a director could be a filmmaker, a screenwriter could be making a, a filmmaker. Sure, but they can't do it. I mean, the producer is the one that kind of is a little bit of the lifeblood of constructing this canvas in which the others, the director and the, and the screenwriter can tell a story. Okay, that helps because I didn't know if people yeah. prefer to be called one versus the other. Or, okay, yeah. okay, good. Yeah, screenwriter's fine for me. All right, fantastic. What about the life and job of a filmmaker would surprise 
your 30 year old self and and that's good I can ask you although I would be curious what you were doing right at 30 and also what advice would you give your 30 year old self I'll start with the first thing is it's not nearly as glamorous as people assume because they see the film and and think that that's oh my gosh you work you work in you know da, 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 da. But 99.9% of what I do is me staring at a screen with a taunting cursor. Okay, what do you got for me? And it's a very solitary endeavor. Yes, when a film comes out, that's terrific. And when you go to a premiere, it's terrific. Uh, What's terrific about it? What's the most fun? It's just so rewarding. For me, and it's an interesting difference between screenwriting and and writing a book is even if I've written something that is just a, a huge, huge bestseller and somebody comes up to me, and I haven't done that, by the way, but if, if someone comes up to me and you they say, have. we just don't know it yet. <laughs> if someone comes up to me and they say, uh, I loved your book, what I'm getting, and that's all they can say, they can say, I loved your book, is, is it's a one step removed, Okay. I, I didn't see them enjoy my book. I didn't see them love my book. All they can do is they say that they love my book. But if I write a screenplay and a film comes out and a line comes up that I hope the audience would laugh at or a scene is coming up that I hope the audience would shed a tear at, I get to experience that. Oh, yeah. So how often do you sit? I mean, when you have, a, and is it different now, when you had... A, and we'll get back to your advice to your 30-year-old sure, self, but now, sure. when you first had your films come out, how often did you go and sit in the in the theater and... As much as possible. And I still do it. I still do it. I, I was fortunate enough to work for Pixar, and, uh, and we released recently Cars 3. And what my wife and I love to do is, because the theatrical release is actually not that long of a, you know... It's, if, if you're really, really, really lucky nowadays, your film will be in theaters for two months. And I worked 20 months on that film. See, just, it's just like now you know how we feel when we're with pregnancies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. That's a great example. Um, and so we go all the time because we realize that after these two months are done, I'll probably never see that film again on the big screen ever. It'll be streaming at home and and uh, on a, on a much smaller screen, and so a lot of times we'll go up front so that we can turn and we can look at the audience. I I, I don't I don't want to creep anybody out, but I do like to see how people. I I love watching the looks on their face. All right. So is is there a moment that you can point to where you were surprised, either in a good way or a bad way, by the audience response to one of your films? And I'll go right back to the very first one, Finding Forrester. We were rehearsing during filming in Toronto, which is where we filmed about half of the film. The rest of it was filmed in New York. And we were having lunch one day with Sean Connery, who played William Forrester, and the four kids, including Rob Brown as Jamal Wallace. And they were tossing around that line. They were tossing around the term dog to each other. And you know, saying, you know, what's up, dog? You know, yeah, that. And and Sean was puzzled by that, and and he just goes, why? What? It's almost he said, like you're using the word dog as a term of affection, and the the kids said, well, yeah, we are. And so this conversation went on, conversation went on, and I'm looking over at Gus Van Sant, the director, and I realize this this has got to be in the film, and so. I wrote down oh, so this, this line. this was just a conversation. This was just a conversation like a lunch. Over, over lunch. And the film was done. By and large done. And so we, we still had a couple of moments, a couple of scenes left that we knew there would be an opportunity to put that in there. And so Sean Connery puts in, you know, he makes this where he's kind of celebrating. He can hear the clicking of the, the keys the, on the typewriter uh, of Jamal. So he knows that he's broken through with this character. And he says, you're the man now, dog. And I remember this was just such a throwaway moment that we just captured and we put in there. And to this day... I remember that, to the, I to remember that part of the film. And, and people just exploded with laughter. And part of it is because it's Sean Connery and it's, uh, it's so awkward. 
And to this day, I, I tell my kids and they shake their head. I said, you know, that that was the birth of the meme because there was a website that was started very, I mean, if you go back and you look the Genesis moment for the meme on in, and that's where it was. They still, to this day, there's a YTMND.com. Is that right? That's out there. So now that makes me wonder, and again, I'll put a pin in that 30-year-old advice, but that does make me wonder, when you write a screenplay, are you reserving chunks that you can take advantage of these opportunities? Or are you, when you're getting together with all these people, do you feel like you're done? You hope you're done, Mm. but you know you're not. Because uh, a scene that may look really, really good on the page and reads like a dream, when you get into a situation where during rehearsal... And you realize, oh, wait a second, the character has to walk across the room and I I didn't give the character enough dialogue or I gave the character too much dialogue. There's things that you just or there, there, there will be dialogue that might just be fine with one actor, but for whatever reason, they get tongue tied. Another one gets and you have to come up with an alternate right there on the moment, because when you're shooting, when you're filming, time is money. And so you have to be nimble. Um, and, then, and then there are times where actors will come up and have a different version of what you said. Well, and that's you, what I was wondering. Yeah. And, and, and what, what do you do when you don't like that? You tell them you don't like it. Ah. And hopefully you have the director on your side. Does that change as you get more and more experience? Yeah, it does. You, you know more what, gravitas? You, yeah, you know what battles to, to, to choose at that point. And you get to a point where the, the, the actors... Aren't, aren't as willing to challenge that anymore. And one of the things that a good director will do is instead of it becoming an issue at the moment, they'll say, well, we'll shoot it both ways. And even if the director has made up his or her mind that, okay, we're going to go with what's on the, on the page. It's placation. The, the, it's placation. <laughs> Got exactly. it. Got exactly. it. Exactly. All right. So back to the question, because that was an interesting detour. Back to the question, what advice would you give your 30-year-old self? I was very happy working in radio. Uh, that was an important thing, chapter of my life. But I would, have done, I would have jumped in the deep end of the pool a little faster because even at the age of 38, you get comfortable in your routine. And even after Finding Forrester came out, I was still working on air. I was still, you know, I had, I had already landed. Were you hedging the, your bets or you just didn't know what it looked like to be a I was I was hedging my bets. Uh, you only get those many, uh, that, that opportunity every so often. And I look back on it now and had I, I, I came very close to just sticking with radio and trying to write screenplays, uh, you know, I, as, a, as a co-career, if you will, I would have regretted it so much had I not given everything I had to screenwriting and wondering what would have what would have been. All right, so unpack that decision. There's a moment or a series of moments that made you say, all right, I'm doing this. It may be resources, it may be bravery, it may be someone else pushing you. What 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 how would you break down that? It was when we finished the rookie, and that was the second film. And I realized the impact that that these stories and these movies were having, you know, not only on my own family and friends, but I would get these letters. And there was one letter that I received, and I still remember this. I've got it up in my office right now. There was a scene in the movie, F. Marie Abraham is being challenged by Jamal Wallace's character on this ancient author, Coleridge. And, and so... F. Murray Abraham's character is surprised that Jamal Wallace has the breadth of knowledge that he has about Coleridge, and they're jockeying back and forth about Coleridge. And I remember getting this letter from the East Coast, from the University of Pennsylvania, from a professor there who said, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate you putting the spotlight on Coleridge. This guy has been lost to history. And, you know, it's, it's, it's things like that where you realize... That, that it makes a difference to people. So the impact that these, that these stories were having, it became apparent to me that this is what I want to do. Okay, so you read this letter. 
this is where I get very geeky about the level of granularity. So you read this letter, you're getting feedback from friends and family. Are they saying to you, dude, you have to do this full time. Yeah. Are you, this is what you need to do. And you're listening and you're listening. You're showing up every day to, you know, your five o'clock spot. Right. And then one day, something, you just say, okay, I'm, you know, you get up in the morning, you take your shower, you're thinking, oh, yeah. and yeah. that decision is made. What did that day look like? I remember that day because I think there was part of me that we were deep. I had written The Rookie. And even then, when you send in a script to the studio, that's a nerve wracking moment because then you're, you're, okay, you're putting it out there. And I remember I got this call back from Nina Jacobson, who at the time was the, the head of Disney film. And I was uncertain about the script. I was, I, I was insecure about the script. And she calls up and she goes, the script is fantastic. And she wasn't just saying it because the next thing that she said was, we're going to green light the film. And so off a first draft, which is just unheard of. And to me, the thing about the movie industry is, you know, they can sweet talk you, but the greatest compliment that a studio can give is their decision to spend millions of their own dollars on the production and the development of a film based on the story that you just told. So at that moment, I just go, I... Like if I had a video camera, I mean, I would be up there dancing. We call it, yeah, but my wife and I call them two champagne bottle nights. Oh, okay. uh, and that was, uh, that was, that That's was fancier than what yeah. I would be like shaking yeah, my booty in it the was, chair. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I, I can clearly just remember the emotion that you feel. And it's, you just realize, because there are so many writers out there who are terrific, who for whatever reason may not just quite get that opportunity. So and is it is it chance meeting choice or I mean is that the a little perfect bit. collision? Yeah, it's 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 a little bit of that because I look back on it now and the movie industry has changed so much in these 20 years, changed from a standpoint of that studios used to make three types of films. So they would make small budget films, middle budget films, and tentpole release films. Now they're only inclined to make tentpole and really, really small. It's the middle films that were, I mean, Finding Forrester was purchased by Sony Columbia Pictures, and it was a studio release from the very start, which meant that it had the full power of the studio. They bought it. They funded it. They did every, every, every dollar of the Finding Four. But if if I wrote Finding Forrester today and I went out there, number one, a studio would not buy it. I would have to get independent financing. I would have to, it would have to be a smaller, much smaller budget to, to, to make it happen. And so it's a it's a different it's a different is game. it is it overall better or worse and for whom? Well it's it it depends on what story you've written. It makes it more of a challenge. But on the flip side of that, and, and this is what's exciting, is it's a television world now. And there are so many opportunities out there for stories to land, places for them to land. It used to be, you know, you had your three networks and you had HBO and, and, and Showtime. Now you have, you know, these countless opportunities. I mean, Netflix is spending $9 billion this year on product. Netflix And both Netflix and Amazon are spending more money this year on creative product than all of the movie studios. It's it's a different world out there. And what's Uh, so interesting when you think about watching experts predict industry trends, not one of them said the future is television 10 years ago. No, 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 no. And, And we're in a golden era right now. I'm a member of the Writers Guild of America. Our contract comes up every three years. And every time when the three years comes up, we realize that there's been a sea change in the industry. It wasn't that long ago that one of the issues that we were fighting for was DVDs. Well, you know, DVDs have gone the way of the dinosaur. Okay, we gotta we gotta talk about streaming residuals. Well, it's just every time there's a there's a different thing to do. So, what's the hottest topic that everyone's talking about, or worried about, or excited about with regard to the future of the film industry? Not that I'm suggesting that it's going to be accurate in five or ten years, right? right? Not based right. on history, but what is that hot topic? We, and and it's been a topic that's gone on for for twenty years. Is is it time to bury 
give last rites to the uh, the theater. And every time we've assumed that that that's the case, we've been proven wrong. But it's very clear that going to a, a movie theater now has become much more of a premium experience. I mean, now they're trying to get people in there from a standpoint of, okay, yes, you can bottle, order a bottle of wine. We can bring food to your seat. We can do this. We can do that. But it's it's more and more going to... We're getting our entertainment at home. Does that affect the stories you write? It can. Yes, it can. Because, you know, I talked about how finding Forrester, I would have to get independent financing now. But there there will be opportunities to, we don't know what distribution is going to be like in two to three years from now. Right. It may be as simple as YouTube, Facebook. They're all going to become major, major players where, because streaming both from an audio standpoint and a visual standpoint, is really, really good right now and only going to get better. So, But we do enjoy watching uh, out of the comfort of our own homes. So do the stories that we enjoy or elements of the story or varieties of the story differ in an intimate setting versus a the- theatrical setting? And do no you question. write differently? Or- no question. Yeah, you just, you know, smaller stories that have an, an intimate feel to them play better on a smaller screen. Does that affect down to the level of granularity of a character? Sure. Yeah. No question. I mean, think about Game of Thrones, for example. It's the best. It's the biggest. Loved uh, it last night. Yeah. I, oh, you and you God. and me both. You and me both. But think about it. Nine out of 10 scenes in Game of Thrones is what? It's two people talking to each other. That's all it is. I mean, there was a scene last night where, you know, Cersei and, and Jamie are having a conversation and she's standing on a map. Of the yeah of the kingdoms and and all that is is an ex- expository scene where they are trying to bring in people who maybe are trying to catch up with the series or maybe are just giving it a, a shot that that was their that was their moment to say okay we're going to try and tell you in forty seconds what this whole last few years have been about and so that's one of the reasons they really choose their battles kind of literally, in, into where they spend their money. There are these enormous scenes that we remember, battle scenes and, and the last 10 minutes of last season. But for the most part, it's, it's a really, really intimate show. Hmm. And when people are in film school now, are they learning to consider the difference, the, the, the projecting the future, being controlled by the by the audience sure. on a smaller screen and a more intimate. Is that part of what they're learning? Well, and, and what it basically what they're learning is what we've always known, but now it's, you know, characters have become more important. And even in the great, I, 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 like I said, I worked for, for 20 months at Pixar and I didn't write the words fade in for six months because the first six months were just talking about these characters. That's one of the reasons why I think Pixar by and large makes good films is because they put such a premium on characters and story. And so what it's doing is it's, it's forcing a lot of writers to get back to the fundamentals, the fundamentals of storytelling. Uh, you know, the fundamentals of storytelling are the same now as they've always been. Sometimes they've just been clouded in the past with technology advancements that incorrectly tempt writers to cut a corner. Aha. Uh-huh. All right. So what is your average creative day look like? Specifically, what do you do when you get up? I'm talking about a day where you're in full creative mode. What do you do? What do you have for breakfast? And how do all of those tiny details affect your creative process? Yeah, I'm a morning writer. And then there are, I, I know a ton of people who are evening writers, but I'm a morning writer. Usually wake up about... 5.30 or 6, spend some time just waking up, iPad out and reading the news. And I don't do my workout in the morning because, well, I'll just get up and I'll have a quick breakfast. I'll have a couple of cups of coffee. What's uh, your breakfast? Uh, go-to breakfast is is seriously just kind of a, it's fruit, eggs. Sometimes it's uh, steel-cut oats. And the third time is usually kind of a smoothie. So those are those are the go tos. Okay, one more one more question. What's yeah. in your smoothie? Because I'm a nerd for that kind of. So thing. it's a green smoothie for sure. So there's a little bit of kale. There's a little bit of apple. There's a little bit of banana in there. A little bit of almond milk. 
Healthy. It's, it's, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's it's healthy. It means uh, there's a bigger lunch coming. That's for sure. And then I, I can I can usually write. I'll go upstairs and I'll write. And I always love to the day before stop just a little bit before. I could finish that off, but I like to, that helps me get a running start the next day. I go, okay. Oh, you're not worried you're going to forget your train of thought. No, well, I've got it kind of scribbled out. So, um, and I can usually write for four to five hours. And then at the end of that, I'll get some lunch. Lunch can be all over the board. And then we'll go for a walk or get in in a, in a workout and already begin to think about what the next day is going to bring. And then if there's things that I need to do from a business standpoint, whether it's calling my agent or calling someone else or, or doing some, you know, that's what the afternoon is for. But you would never jump back on with a creative idea, jump back into your office and start writing again at like, you know, six or seven o'clock. If I'm on deadline, I do. And I don't like it. Yeah. I don't like it at all. There was one time and it was one of the most uncomfortable things where I just, I had to, um, it was the nativity story and we were just, the director was getting on a plane going to Jerusalem. We had a, a huge afternoon session and I knew that there was a lot of work. I knew that this was, if, if I would have had no time constraints at all, it would have been a week's worth of work. And she needed it by 10 a.m. the next day. And I love writing at home. I don't like writing in unfamiliar places. And it was a textbook case where I was in my hotel room in Los Angeles with pots of coffee coming. And I wrote throughout the, I, I did an all-nighter. And I just remember at like five in the morning thinking to myself, you lose the sense of whether what you're doing is any good was at it? that point. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't It was 100%, but it carried the day. She took it to Jerusalem, the casting directors. You know, it was it was interesting because I remember we had this, this young kid who was auditioning for the role of Joseph, and he had never really been in anything. And that was Oscar Isaac. This was his first role, and he's now, now he's in, you know, Star Wars films and... And anything and everything. Did I go back when I had more time to fix those scenes? Yeah, I sure did. But it had to, it had to happen that night. I'm very excited about your book. And thinking about your creative process, I want to hear a little bit about your book. Is it the same for your book? Is the creative process the same for your book? The schedule is the same, but but it's a different type of writing, that's for sure. And the, na- and the name of the book is Scavenger's Hunt, and it's spelled with a K instead of a C. And what it is basically is an origin story, goes, it dates back to the late 1800s, and this mysterious kind of charismatic character, not unlike Willy Wonka in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, who was the designer of the first and the greatest ever scavenger hunt. There's a little time travel involved. For me, it was a throwback to the to the books that I really enjoyed as a kid. Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Wizard of Oz. You have these fantastical tales which have almost some supernatural element to them, but at the core, they're usually about a young character, young siblings in Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe who are dealing with something. And so this was no different. And I have three grandchildren now, so the the thought of writing something, a type of story that was important to me as a child and hopefully is important to them was was really, really enticing. But to your question about was it different? Yeah, because all of my writing and my career over the past 20 years has been for this visual medium of screenwriting. And so if I want to write a scene, like right now, if I was writing this scene with us, all I need to do is at the start of a scene is say, interior recording studio day. That's all I need to say, because the film is going to do the describing for me. And so, but oh, my editors, if there was a mantra that I heard time and time again, and they were absolutely right. Description, description, description. You can have, uh, you can have the, the, perfect scene, but if you do not make, if you do not describe the setting, if you do not describe the, what the, what the looks are on there, then the the moment fails. So that's the biggest difference. When does the book come out? It comes out in November and I'm really excited about it because it's actually kind of a Christmas story, a holiday season story, because of the fact we have this young 12 year old character, 12 year old Henry Babbitt, who is, he's the main character. He's lost his father just a, a year earlier. So he's wrestling with that, goes to visit with his, you know, kind of quirky grandfather on Christmas Eve and, and. His grandfather tells him the story of Hunter Scavenger's first 
scavenger hunt back in 1885 and how he had put out these clues that were all over New York, but that nobody had ever won the hunt. Nobody had won the hunt. And of course, his grandfather says, Henry, if nobody ever won the hunt, then the clues are still out there. So that sets the stage for for Henry. Well, I'm excited for it to come out. Is that that people can find it. Can they pre-order? When can they pre-order? Yeah, they can pre-order right now. Yes. It comes out on November 14th and I'm partnering with a, a really exciting young publishing house that's called Ink Shares. And it's all one word, Ink Shares. And if you just go to inkshares.com and you either word search my name, Mike Rich or Scavengers Hunt, it'll pop right up there. Great. And that will be in the show notes and the resource list at Applied Curiosity Lab. Dot com forward oh, terrific. Slash blog. I appreciate so there'll that. be show notes and all the links to all that so people can jump on that. As we wrap up, I like to ask what I call quick curiosity questions, okay. just a, a QCQs, terrific. just to kind of give people a little insight into you and also give them another reason to kind of go back and see if they should jump on some of the things that you like. And the first one is, what is your favorite under $100 purchase that you've made in the last year or so? Under $100. <laughs> Does a bottle of wine count? <laughs> yeah, what, yeah, sure. What kind of wine? Uh, we live out here in, in Oregon Pinot country, and so, uh, yeah, I'll go with that. There's a wonderful winery. This is actually under $50, uh, Eminent Domain, which I just love the name. And uh, well, That's a great make name. It terrific, yeah. And what yeah. kind? Is it a Pinot? It's a Pinot. Okay, yeah. great. So we'll put the link to that okay, so people can check out Eminent yeah. Domain Pinot. And what is one book, documentary, film, musician, or artist that you recommend that we all check out? It could be some video you saw on YouTube, a book that you've read? You know, I, I still, I've kind of got into a Ken Kesey renaissance. He's best known for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I read one, The Last Round of Me, which is a story about the Pendleton Roundup and the history of it. So I've, I've kind of had a little bit of a Ken Kesey. Uh, oh, I'm so moment. glad. I have, yeah. not heard, I have not read that, but you know, as a third generation Oregon native, yeah. I was just, and you're from Enterprise, Oregon. I'm right? from Enterprise, Oregon. Okay. So, maybe so that's we part just went to Pendleton yeah. for the first time ever. We went to Joseph. We went on a rail where you pedal from Joseph to Enterprise. Yep. So we did that. And I ended up meeting with the owner of Hamley's and interviewed him for the podcast. Oh, for goodness sakes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Parley Pierce. Yeah. Fascinating cowboy. Interesting. So I'm so glad because we're going to go back to Pendleton to interview the guy, the French guy, who is in charge of the most famous Western saddle making academy in the world that they operate up at the back you of will have You will have such a, 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 an appreciation for Pendleton after, after reading that book. Ken Kesey, apparently he did not need an editor to tell him description, description, description. Oh, he, he already had that figured out. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. so that's a great recommendation. And then the final question is, if you were given $50 million and you had to use it in some way to make the world a better place, how would you spend it? How would you use it? How would you direct that money? Everything I've gotten, in, and I, I've been involved in, in a number of charities, ranging from Ronald McDonald House Charities and Children's Center out in, in Clackamas. And so, so many of the, I have such a soft spot for children's issues. It would be educationally based, I think, you know, just uh, giving opportunities to, I, I would split it, $25 million for health initiatives internationally and opportunity based, I think, within the United States for children. Can I weasel you to consider once your book is out there in the world and you've experienced that whole thing to come back and talk about that? I would love to. Okay. I, I am so excited about it. Yeah, I would love to do that. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much for coming. Absolutely, Becky. This Good to really see you. This is really fun. Good to see you. Mike Rich is an award-winning filmmaker and author of the book Scavenger's Hunt. Thanks so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. Before you take off, I have a quick question and a few more things to let you know about. One, you can find show notes and all resources mentioned at AppliedCuriosityLab.com forward slash blog. And the question, would you enjoy joining the ranks of curiosity seekers and adventurous thinkers? If so, you are invited to join the tribe of the curious. You'll receive Quick Curiosity Monday. This short weekly email is curiosity lube for your brain. It consists of ideas I'm pondering, curiosities the tribe has shared, and things that I'm enjoying that I suspect you might too. 
Just go to AppliedCuriosityLab.com to join, or you can probably just pick your favorite search engine and type in Tribe of the Curious. And let's connect online at Becky Saltzman on Twitter and on Facebook at Applied Curiosity Lab. Finally, in order to avoid missing insights from outside the boundaries of ordinary, subscribe to Applied Curiosity Lab Radio on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, and all the other places podcasts hide and wait to be discovered. In the meantime, elevate curiosity.